Today, we are joined by Dr. Aida Habtazeon. She made a risky and bold career move when she took a leave of absence from Stanford University to become Pfizer's chief medical officer. Add to that, we were still in the middle of a global pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Habtazeon, who grew up in Eritrea, which is on the Horn of Africa, uh, lived in four different countries in her life, and she really brings a global perspective to her work at Pfizer. She's responsible for getting the correct information to patients, doctors, and regulatory agencies about how to safely use Pfizer's medications. And she's here to talk about her incredible career, her passion for health equity, and how we can bring more women into healthcare leadership. So welcome, doctor. What brought you to leave a tenured position and go work for a pharmaceutical company in the middle of a pandemic? For me, it wasn't something that I was expecting. And I tend to think and plan. Like usually I think about five years ahead or something like that. But it was a nice opportunity when Pfizer approached me. Um, I decided to take a look at it, to take a mm-hmm. closer look. One thing also that attracted me to Pfizer was those values. Those core values mm-hmm. meant a lot to me. Courage, excellence, equity, and joy. And then the other thing that made me also why I wanted to take this that resonated highly for me was the purpose blueprint. For me, that was like breakthroughs that change patients' lives. As a physician scientist, I always think about my patients. I always think of the unmet need, all the kind of things that patients struggle with. What drove you to, to, to this career? I've always had the curious mind. I was like sort of this, even as a child, as a kid, I'm told like I would be asking why mechanisms. I used to be Uh that, you know. You were one of those. I was one of those. (laughs) And, you know, I would continuously try to find, if I can't find an answer, I would look for another book or another person to ask. So it was like that for me. Actually, it was the science. Mm -hmm. Science is something that um, I loved and um, I continued, in fact, on that journey. So whatever it was going to be, was going to be in science. And I like to teach. I I thought because the reason is because I never am satisfied with my own answers because Mm -hmm. I think the people you teach also teach you a lot. Mm. So um, beyond Eritrea, you've lived on uh, three continents in four different countries. And I'm wondering um, if your sort of international experience built into your growing up Mm -hmm. and your life... um, how it impacts your career, your life as a a physician and a researcher, if perhaps that international perspective is added value in some way? I do think so, because I think in my practice or even when I was teaching or um, the different people that you impact their career, we are a very heterogeneous society. When I think of practice of medicine, there is the science, the evidence and the data, but there is art to it. So it's Mm -hmm. a combination of science and art so that you start to look at your patients holistically. And so I I do think, you know, having that different way of thinking, different perspectives, I think it does open up your your thinking and also your acceptance as well as you're trying to filter through it. You don't come to conclusion very quickly. That's amazing. It makes you a better doctor, for sure, because you can really Mm -hmm. ask the right questions or you know what you don't know, Mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about leadership. It's, I think, the World Health Organization. Uh, women account for 70% of the global healthcare sector. So that's a lot of women working in healthcare. Yet at the leadership level, at the executive level, it's just about 25% women. Why do you think there's such a large gap? I feel like sometimes there are inherent things, and then there are some things that are indirect effects, which mm-hmm. means that as women in many cultures, in many societies, women are the, they take care of children. They take care of sometimes they are caregivers and caretakers also of aging parents or others. Sometimes it's difficult too. like, for example, as a scientist, you get out for one, two years. And I can go back thinking when I was a postdoc and uh, the struggles is if you move, you become obsolete so, very quickly. Okay, so it's hard to come back. That's one of the issues, one right? It's not issues. all of it. But if you look, for example, at the postdoctoral training, even yeah. in medicine, there are more women. 
yeah. than there are men. So where we are losing them is in that ladder upwards, in, right? All the way. And usually it's those are the, some of the times where um, there are these responsibilities that women would take. But there, of course, there are other things yeah. too. Women are not very good advocates of themselves. They are um, not. But they are very good advocate of, of others. Exactly. Another thing that I noticed and I learned through this journey was also that um, women get promoted. They don't ask to be promoted because they get promoted for for what they show and demonstrate. Without, whereas I think these studies have been shown where men get promoted for their potential. One of the things that was important and I would give advice to other women is to explore, to not mm. be afraid even to just explore. Um, I think that was one of the things maybe I didn't do when I was younger. Uh, I tended to be very focused and just, you know, head right. one way. But I think it's important to to explore uh, because that's how one can grow in the leadership position. So any other advice for women in terms of getting to leadership positions, climbing in the ranks in your sector, in healthcare, in science? So I've learned to speak up. Uh, and also, it's my personality. I'm more. I've always grown up to be more of an introvert, and I've learned to become extrovert intentionally. The other thing is paying it forward. I think mm. it's important for us to expose other women. I think always. mentorship is one thing that I. That's another thing. Part of the teaching has also been the career mentorship, and I try to serve also myself as a mentor to other women. And you mean female and male? Absolutely. Mentors and allies. Absolutely. I think many men had influenced my career. In fact, my mentors were men right. who really supported and advocated for me. So I think that is uh, important. You've talked about the importance of having a light speed mindset. Mm -hmm. I want to know what that is and how women can use this mindset. So this is a term that was coined at Pfizer um, in relation to the COVID-19 program because there was a sense of urgency. Think of it not only of a time, but where is where do you need to spend your time? What do you need to shed? Because at right. the end of the day, there's only certain hours, right? So um, how do you prioritize your work? For me, especially in, in my role, is making sure that data, quality, integrity, and safety, these are not the things that you would cut corners, but there are other things that you can work in parallel so that you can become efficient. So you have the right team for the right decision makers, empowering the right people. So I think it's a mindset and a change as well as shift in the culture. I want to ask you, I know very passionate um, for you is health equity. How do we get there? Because health equity is a huge problem. So what we had to think about is I'm already doing something in my profession. I have expertise in certain things. Everybody's an expert in something, right? But if we can embed that equity, if we can embed health equity, that means then we are embedding it into the business and it doesn't become as a separate entity. In fact, the first project that we worked, because when we looked, as you said, it's so huge, where do I start? Right. Was let's look at Pfizer's pipeline. What is, where is our expertise? What are the disease areas for which we have expertise, for which we are developing therapies, for which we are bringing breakthroughs? So we broke it up and there were about 38 diseases or so. And we started to look actually, what does the literature tell us? What are the, where are the disparities? So we started to look at those. And then we started to look, of course, now we are at the point, uh, we started, we launched this um, Institute of Translational Equitable Medicine. That's where we started. So we, we said, let's look at what Pfizer is doing. Where are the pipelines? What are the disease? What does that look like. So we published a paper looking at the literature with the existing data because it can help us. It can become like a North Star. Another thing that we learned was also where the data was lacking. So hopefully others can do the same and can find the data because they would be focusing on different diseases. The third thing that we learned is that how we this could be used at the bedside. It may be very clear to those in the field, but it may not be widely clear also to, uh, you know, when it comes to the healthcare system, whether it's policy, public health, right. or um, practicing physicians. What are your goals for the next decade of your life? 
So there are two things. I separate them. What does my, you know, when my boss, uh, one of my uh, <laughs> boss said, like, you know, what does your head tell you? What does your heart tell okay. you? Okay. I hope they're in line. I they can are see. Aligned. They? Okay, yes. good. <laughs> my, my head is usually that of a physician scientist. Mm-hmm. I tend to be driven by the evidence, by the medicine, by the science. So there are those things where I'm thinking, how can we accelerate? How can the things that we learn from the COVID-19 program, how can we make, sh- you know, how can we uh, implement those? How can we accelerate our pipelines? My heart, of course, is that of equity because of where I come from and because of the kind of patients that I took care. I was very fortunate to practice. Equity is very important. And when we think also of equity, we think about regionally, but there is also that global equity. So in this healthcare field, and this is what attracted me. Again, I go back to those core equi- core values that brought me to to this position. So I do think this is the my my if I'm going to think about the 10 years, that's going to be so I'm going to be leading with my head and my heart. Yes. <laughs> and you get that equity, every accomplishment brings you joy. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Dr. Aida Habtazion, thank you very much for being on Mika Straight Up. Thank you for giving me this opportunity.